In order for muscle to, muscles to contract, they need a steady supply of ATP. Remember, the ATP is used by myosin to form cross bridges and also to detach cross bridges. So ATP is our only source used directly for contractile activity. And what's really amazing is that there is only four to six seconds worth of ATP that is already going to be um, located in the muscle. So there has to be other ways to immediately generate energy so that we can continue muscle contraction for more than four to six seconds. And these are the three primary pathways that occur. The first type is called direct phosphorylation of ADP by creatine phosphate. And the fancy word phosphorylation simply means to add a phosphate. And essentially this is a way to regenerate that ATP. So as you can see creatine kinase here is um, the enzyme which is used to add the phosphate to ADP. So now we have ATP available. So there's now more energy that would be available for a short duration of time up to 15 seconds as you can see here at the bottom of the slide. The second mechanism to generate ATP which is for a little bit longer period of time would be the anaerobic activity and anaerobic means without oxygen and so this is what we commonly think of as anaerobic types of exercise so when we're lifting a um, doing a bench press or doing a short short burst of activity that would be an anaerobic exercise and since there's no oxygen available in this case after glycolysis occurs and glycolysis is the chemical breakdown of glucose into pyruvic acid once the pyruvic acid is made since there is no oxygen present lactic acid will be released into the bloodstream the other situation that can also occur here is the Cori cycle and in this case the Cori cycle is going to convert the lactic acid back into a source that can then be used for eventual ATP to be made but anaerobic respiration is the time um, our muscles when they're contracting vigorously and contract out activity is about 70% of the maximum that's possible. And when you're in the um, when you're in a gym, when you get on an elliptical or a treadmill, and you'll notice that it measures your maximal activity. When it's above 65 to 70 percent, that would be an anaerobic state, and when it's a lower state, that would be an aerobic respiration state, the sort of fat burning state. So aerobic exercise means with oxygen. And in this case, the great thing about it is it can use multiple sources of substrates. And so not only can glucose be used, but fatty acids can also be used, amino acids can also be used. But the key here is oxygen, and there is a mitochondria that would be present, which remember you learned back in Chapter 3 is the powerhouse of the cell. This is the type of energy that would be produced for marathon runners. They can have a long duration of exercise. In our next slide here we can see a short duration exercise. The first six seconds, the four to six seconds are due to the stored ATP that already is in the muscles. This is kind of the ATP which is already on tap. Then there is a second amount of ATP that is going to be synthesized through direct phosphorylation. So the direct phosphorylation is when we involve creatine phosphate. This is the same type of creatine that you can actually get at GNC, but it's really not necessary because we already have a certain amount of creatine that's available. The creatine molecule is going to act as a bus to transport this phosphate. So this phosphate is transferred to ADP to synthesize the ATP that would be used for this 10 seconds. 
So the combined 15 seconds of activity is going to be made up of the ATP that is stored and the ATP formed from direct phosphorylation of creatine phosphate. And then what happens after this is due to the amount of glycogen that is stored in the muscle. Remember glycogen is an example of a an important polysaccharide. It's many thousands and thousands of units of glucose molecules put together. This is stored in the muscle and it's going to be broken down to glucose. How it is utilized then is going to determine the length of the time with which we can exercise. So it's, if it's a short duration of activity, 30 to 40 seconds, then this would be the anaerobic respiration that occurs. So it's without oxygen and there is lactic acid that is produced. The lactic acid is going to lower the pH of our bloodstream and that is going to cause this burning sensation that we feel in our muscles especially if we're doing an activity that we may not really be well suited for. So if um, an unconditioned person suddenly starts to to um, try to run a mile and after that first minute or so they start to feel this burning sensation. The um, third example of muscle metabolism is aerobic respiration and this is the one that's with oxygen and it produces a lot of ATP. And there can be an example of 32 ATP that is produced per one glucose molecule. So there's a lot more ATP than what's available in anaerobic exercise. In anaerobic exercise, there's only about 2 ATP that is produced. Now, muscle fatigue is a state of physiological inability to contract even though the muscle may still be receiving stimuli. There are many factors that can contribute to this, but when this starts to occur, the person goes into oxygen debt. And so it's kind of the point at which the muscle uh, needs to gain oxygen in order to return to a resting state. So when a, when a person, when a tissue itself is in muscle fatigue, when it needs to return back to its resting state, these are some of the important factors that need to be replenished. The oxygen stores need to be replenished there has to be lactic acid that is converted back to pyruvic acid. This would be the Cori cycle that does this. This is kind of something extra, it's not in your textbook. And then the glycogen stores must be replenished so that the next time the muscle wants to, con wants to contract, then the glycogen could easily, easily be broken down into glucose the ATP and the creatine phosphate reserves must be resynthesized so, so that the next time ADP can be phosphorylated to make ATP. So oxygen debt is the extra amount of oxygen that is needed in order to rebalance the metabolic activities of the tissue. And so all non-aerobic sources of AT are going to contribute to this. So anytime that we are doing a anaerobic exercise, this is going to contribute much more quickly to getting into oxygen debt. And the extra amount of oxygen that the body must take in for these restorative processes to occur are called the EPOC. EPOC stands for excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. Now our body, um, there's only about 40% of the energy that's released during muscle contraction that is converted to actual work. The remaining 60% of it is given off as heat. And if you think back to one of the major functions of the skeletal muscle, this is one of the important roles of it. Remember that we start to shiver in order to warm up. So we sh our skeletal muscles are going to shiver to increase body temperature, but from a homeostatic protective standpoint, these dangerous heat levels 
are prevented um, from overheating the body because of the radiation of heat from the skin and then also from the sweat. So this is a really important protective mechanism. The shivering would be the opposite of this case here. So shivering would be to generate body heat to warm up, but in this case when we are overly sweating, um, especially the heat is going to be released by radiation to help us to cool down. So this is to cool down and shivering is to do the opposite to help us to warm up if it's very cold outside. This slide is showing the factors that increase to the f increase the force of the skeletal muscle contraction. And the first one that's shown is the size of the muscle fibers that are being recruited. So the bulkier the muscle, the greater its cross-sectional area, the more tension it can develop and the greater its strength is going to be. So regular resistance exercise can increase the force by causing these muscles to grow or increase in size. So um, certainly um, when we talked about motor unit recruitment, remember if a muscle is going to be maximally stimulated, then there's going to be many motor units that are actually going to be recruited. The next factor is the size of the muscle fiber itself. The third one would be the high frequency of stimulation, uh, wave summation, which leads to tetanus. And remember that a smooth muscle contraction would be called complete tetanus. So these waves are going to summate on top of each other so that we see a nice and smooth titanic contraction. And then the last factor is going to be the muscle and the sarcomere stretch. And there is going to be an optimal stretch of the sarcomeres to a point where all the cross bridges have formed because this is a limiting factor. There is only so many cross bridges that could actually form. And our next slide is showing this length tension relationship. This is a very important relationship and in order for um, the this, this sarcomere to be at its optimal operating length, it needs to be between 80 and 120 percent of its resting length. So this would be the optimal length. Anything less than that would mean that the sarcomere is too, too shortened. And in this case, if it is over shortened, it's going to be limited because the actin myofilaments, the thin filaments in the sarcomere are going to overlap and the, um, the thick filaments are going to actually run into the Z-disc. So this is going to actually force, prevent more shortening from occurring. So less than 80% is really not optimal. 75% is about, about the limit by which they could shorten. On the other opposite extreme, there is too much lengthening that can occur. This over lengthening would be 120% or greater. And when a muscle is extremely stretched, the there are going to be no more cross bridges that can actually occur in this case. So as you can see from this diagram right here, the myosin has nothing else to grab onto. So the myosin will continue to attempt to form cross bridges, but it's unable to. So ATP is broken down and the myosin reaches up and tries to grab onto an actin, but there is nothing left for it to grab onto. So this length tension relationship is 80 to 120%. This slide is showing some, showing the difference between um, the factors that influence the velocity and the duration of skeletal muscle contraction. 
So one of one important factor of the contract velocity is the type of fiber. And if it's a very fast fiber, it's called a fast glycolytic fiber. We'll learn about these in the next couple slides. But in a fast glycolytic fiber, the contractile velocity is very, very quick. However, this muscle fiber is going to, is going to fatigue very quickly as well. So that's the downside to it. As far as the contractile duration, um, the duration is going to occur when we have the opposite types of fibers. We have what are called slow oxidative fibers. These are the fibers that are going to contract for a long period of time and they're going to be resistance very they're going to be resistant to fatigue. However, they're not going to have that quick velocity that we would have in the fast glycolytic fibers. So the mix of the two would be um, a little bit of both, a little bit of velocity but also length of time. If you think back to the um, old fable about the tortoise and the hare, this would be the hare, the one that finishes the race very, very quickly, but the tortoise, the one that continues to, continues to contract for the entire race, this would be the slow oxidative types of fibers. And so it's important for you to know the three different types of fibers that we have. And what I would encourage you to do, instead of just trying to memorize this list, is to think about these different extremes that we have. And some of the various factors that are very important to be able to compare and contrast are referring to the previous slide, the speed of contraction, and the duration of the contraction. So the speed of contraction is going to be due to the myosin ATPase activity. So this is the enzyme that is going to break down the ATP. And so if it breaks the ATP down, hydrolyzes it very quickly, then it's going to be a fast glycolytic fiber. The other factor is the amount of oxygen that is available for muscle metabolism. So if the muscle is able to metabolize and make ATP oxidatively, then it's going to have a high oxidative capacity. And this is going to be due to the primary pathway for ATP synthesis. So the opposite of the, the opposite extreme from the fast glycolytic fibers is the slow oxidative fibers. These would be the tortoise fibers, the ones that can continue to last the entire race, they just not may not be the first ones. And this would be the type that uses aerobic respiration for synthesis. So these are the two opposite extremes I encourage you to think about when you're learning these differences. So if you know these two main differences, you should be able to figure out the rest of these and hopefully they'll make sense to you. So the slow oxidative fiber is going to be the aerobic fibers that has a high amount of oxygen they have a high amount of oxygen if they have a high amount of myoglobin. Remember, myoglobin is the protein that's going to transport oxygen in the muscle. They also have a slow rate of fatigue there, fatigue resistance, so they can continue to um, run a marathon, for example. But the speed of contraction is very slow, so you can see the myosin ATPase activity is very very slow as well. So let's compare this to the extreme opposite, the fast glycolytic fibers. These are the anaerobic types that are going to make very little ATP and so this is the type of muscle that will be used for very fast movement. But with that fast movement they also fatigue very very quickly. So there's a low amount of oxygen content and we know it's an anaerobic environment, so only a couple ATPs are made per glucose molecule. These are activities for short, intense movements, powerful movements like it may be a bench press, hitting a baseball, sudden quick movements, being able to dunk a basketball, fast glycolytic fibers. Whereas the slow oxidative fibers would be the extreme opposite, endurance types of activity, running a marathon, 
maintaining posture, slow movements, but muscle movements that are going to last for a long period of time. So then if we think about the structural classifications down here at the bottom of your slide, they should make sense as well. If there's a lot of oxygen, there's going to be lots of um, capillaries, many capillaries bringing that blood supply in fresh with rich and fresh with oxygen so we would expect a red color whereas if there's very little oxygen there's few capillaries and the muscle would look very white or pale so the fast oxidative fibers then are, then are going to be the hybrid between these two extremes they're going to have an intermediate amount of glycogen Remember, glycogen would be found in fast glycolytic fibers, which makes sense. So there's a quick amount of glucose available, but very little aerobic activity. Fast oxidative has a little bit of both. It's intermediate, and it would be things for some sprinting and some walking as well. So you need to know the types of activities that are best suited for each of these three different types of skeletal muscle tissues.